So the bottom line is that uh, we stereotype people in uh, in many different ways. Now, i got to hold on here a second. I'm still trying to get the hang of this technology here. But in that circle, they're supposed to be that. Okay, we stereotype all kinds of people uh, in many different ways. So what else uh, contributes to um, how we uh, define the situation? So we've already talked. We've talked all about stereotypes. We've done enough on that. Um, the next thing I think is going to be a little bit of a review for you. So what else, you know, what, else, what other kinds of information uh, provide us with meaning about, about, you know, the significance of a social interaction that we're having? Well, it's personal space would be one. So this is all going back to uh, when we talked about culture and uh, different kinds of nonverbal communication. So one of those things was personal space. Uh, and so I want you to remember here, Edward T. Hall. We talked about Edward T. Hall. He wrote that book called The Silent Language. And, um, uh, you know, he, he gives us this kind of chart uh, depicting uh, in North America uh, acceptable distances for personal space. And so, you know, I, I'm not going to go rehash that again. Uh, just Just maybe want to uh, recall it, bring it back to mind. Okay, so what else then? Well, we get uh, another kind of uh, nonverbal communication, and that would be touching. You know, what what is the meaning of touching in a uh, social interaction? Well, we know that um, rules about the frequency and the meaning of touching vary across cultures. We talked, maybe we talked about that a little bit. Um, have a picture here of former President George Bush uh, with the <laughs> with the, uh, the uh, prince of Saudi Arabia, and you'll notice here that they're holding hands. And you know this, I think, in again in North American society, this would not be typ typically acceptable um, behavior, right? Typically, ex a typically acceptable gesture um, between men uh, in public. Uh, and uh, however, this is, you know, quite a acceptable and very common way that men interact with each other in, uh, in the Middle East, in Saudi Arabia, for example. And so President Bush is uh, using the sort of nonverbal vocabulary of Saudi Arabians here. Right. Now, we also know that you know, when we talk about touching, we not only have rules about touching being relative to, you know, big cultural context, but uh, also micro cultural context. So uh, status, you know, one of the things uh, that defines what is acceptable or unacceptable touching is often defined by the status, uh, the, the prestige of the people uh, interacting with each other. Um, so for our, uh, in our culture, for example, as I say here, higher status individuals are given uh, a little bit more leeway, right, in terms of uh, how, how they can touch uh, those of lower status. So it might be more acceptable, for example, for a boss to, um, you know, Put his arms around an employee, put his arms around the shoulders of an employee, uh, you know, talk about, uh, you know, what a great job they're doing or something like that. Um, but maybe that doesn't work the other way. Maybe that, uh, you know, be a, you, it would be a little bit uh, dicier, right, for uh, an underling to take that kind of liberty with one of his or her bosses. Uh, on the other hand, you know, to not to be glib about it, but, uh, you know, where you touch somebody is also has meaning, too. So, you know, if you put your arm around somebody and say, hey, you're doing a great job, keep up the good work, that has a whole different meaning than if you, uh, let's say, touch them, touch them on the buttocks, right? That's going to that's going to be a lawsuit. Uh, so where you touch somebody also has meaning, also has significance, and also defines the situation. Eye contact is another one, another, another uh, signifier, another 
thing that gives meaning, right, to, uh, uh, to interaction. Um, eye contact takes on all different kinds of meaning. So here I have a couple of pictures here of eye contact, right? So the, the picture on the, the left, right is clearly two guys who have eyes locked on each other and they and that is very very confrontational um and then on the other side here on the right hand side well you know first of all we have uh, uh, uh hall's notion of intimate space these people are actually touching foreheads they are intimate they're hugging each other and their eyes are locked on each other too um, but the, the meaning of the eye contact on the right uh, is very, very different than the meaning of the eye contact on the left. And the, these eye contact examples show us how eye contact is information that we interpret um, as we give meaning to or define situations that we're in. So it depends on the context, right? Eye contact, like everything else, depends on the context. Does it mean aggression? Does it mean intimacy? Uh, and so on. And maybe you want to remember, right, the code of the street. Remember that article by Elijah Anderson. He talks about eye contact, right? So maybe go back to that article. Uh, what does he say eye contact means uh, according to this, this thing he calls the code of the street? Um, uh, you know, and, and, and how important is it in the way that people define the situation that they are in? And here's another, another one, another bit of nonverbal communication, smiling, right? So here's Mother Teresa here. What can be, what could be nicer than a, than a smile from Mother Teresa? Um, in America, again, it's going to be cultural context, right? So in America, smiling is a sign of friendliness, right? And in the business world, it's a sign of service. If any of you have ever worked in service, you know, as servers or waiters or waitresses or what have you, um, smiling is this uh, sign, this signal, uh, the symbol of uh, service. I am happy to be at your service, right? Service with a smile. That's, uh, you know, besides e pluribus unum, uh, service with a smile should probably be on the money uh, in the United States. Um, but that's not the same uh, everywhere. Uh, so other cultures define smiling differently. Uh, in Germany, for example, uh, you know, Walmart, an American corporation, goes over, sets up shop in in Germany, uh, the, the American company instructs its workers to smile. Um, and people in Germany, customers in Germany start to complain uh, because in Germany, you know, smiling at a stranger is actually taken as a sign of flirtation. So, you know, these customers are, you know, wondering why Walmart employees are all coming on to them. Um, you have, uh, that other article on Hong Kong, right? Uh, McDonald's in Hong Kong, and it talks about smiling in there. And it says that, you know, in, in, in parts of, well, in Hong Kong, but also in other parts of Asia, um, the smiling is taken as a sign that you are trying to rip me off so I don't trust you. The smiling stranger, right, is not to be trusted. Um, so just a, another example of how cultural context matters, right? And how cultural context determines the, the meaning of these various gestures and how we're going to interpret uh, the settings and the interactions that we're in. Okay, so everything we've done so far is leading up to this, the uh, discussion of uh, Irving Goffman. Um, you'll know in your book that uh, uh, Henslin talks about something he calls the presentation of self in everyday life. And that's taken from a title. As you'll see, that's taken from a title of one of, one of Goffman's books. Um, and just by looking at the uh, title here, one of the things that you might notice is that uh, he's talking about the self right, as something that we present. 
All right. The self is something that we present. We present we present it to others. I want you uh, or I say this, I present the self that uh, I want to be seen as. I, that was awkward, but that's basically it. I present myself to you in the way that I want to be seen. I try to get you to see me in a certain way. Um, and you'll see, or maybe you'll remember uh, that, you know, this is very similar to what Bob Kowser was doing. Right, in his uh, kind of navigating those stereotypes. So, you know, when he's with, uh, you know, he's in that world of academia, he wants to be perceived uh, in a way consistent with what he believes is acceptable appearance uh, as a professor. And when he's with his football team, he wants to be seen in a way that he feels is accepted uh, at a manner, right, to, uh, as an as a athlete on a football team. So uh, Irving Goffman, 1922 to 1982, he was a symbolic interactionist. So we know what that means. <clears throat> Social interaction is mediated by symbols. And as we interact with each other, we are gleaning meaning, right? And that meaning is gonna come from all different kinds of sources of information, all of them that go into defining the situation. So we've talked about stereotypes and eye contact and touching and distance and all that kind of stuff. Um, uh, and, and again, we are presenting a self as we are interacting with others. I, I am presenting a self to you and you are presenting a self to me. All right. So where do we go next? Well, we have three of his more important books. Okay. Three of his more important works. Um, Presentation of Self in Everyday Life came out in 1959. Again, the self is something we present. That's gonna be his main thing. Uh, in a lot of ways, we wanna remember that as a symbolic interactionist, he was influenced by people like uh, Charles Horton Cooley, he's influenced by George Herbert Mead, and you know, um, in, a, in a very big way, presentation of self in everyday life is a kind of an elaboration on both of those things, especially on the looking glass self. Um, Asylums, okay, so the book Asylums, and actually the book Asylums and the book Stigma, uh, the way perhaps we can understand these is, well, presentation of self in everyday life, this is Goffman, he's laying out this general framework, his general approach to symbolic interactionism. Um, and then asylums and stigma are applications of that framework to, for want of a better way to put it, applications of that framework to real life situations, okay? So the first one is the first book that comes after that, 1961, Asylums, Essays on the Social Situation of Mental Patients and Other Inmates. A lot of important stuff going on in that book. Um, he is going to make the argument that mental patient is a social role, um, just like any other social role. A mental patient is a role, just like student is a role, just like professor is a role. And we're socialized into that role and we learn how to play it for others. Um, so, uh, why do people end up in mental hospitals? Well, he's going to talk about a lot of reasons for that, but even independent of whatever symptoms they have, you know, whatever kind of psychological symptoms they have, they're, they're under a, a socialization process and um, that socialization process works on them and they learn the role of mental patient the same way that you learn the role of student or uh, the way those Marine Corps recruits learn the role of Marine uh, in Gwen Dyer's article. Um, stigma, uh, notes on the management of spoiled identity. So let's look at that title a little bit. We're going to get into all these books in more detail, but let's look at that title a little bit. It's called Stigma. So what do you know about stigma right now, just from looking at the title, that what he means by stigma is a spoiled identity, an identity that is undesired, and that people try to manage this identity. 
They try to manage the, an identity um, in such a way as to minimize characteristics that they believe are threatening uh, to their presentation of self as something or someone who is uh, competent uh, or of value. So um, uh, uh, people try to uh, manage identity in a way that deflects attention uh, from these undesired uh, characteristics. Um, so what is a stigma? It's a spoiled identity. What else is he talking about? Management of identity. This is something we do every day. We manage identity. So he's using the example of people who are trying to deflect stigma um, uh, as a way of talking about the process by which we all uh, manage an identity. I try to get you to perceive me in the way that I want to be perceived. You try to get your, you try to get me to perceive you in a way that you want to be perceived. Um, and uh, that is what we all do. So uh, here we go. Let's go to the next slide here. Presentation of self in everyday life. Irving Goffman's presentation of self in everyday life. 